Another great news, I'm a grandfather now. Woohoo! Pretty proud. All of you watching online, <laughs> welcome here. Um, we had our annual meeting uh, last Monday, and we had a great time. It was very well attended. It was amazing to see the unity of the church and also uh, the uh, expectation or the, the excitement for what God has in store for Gospel Mission Church. And uh, I'd just like to thank all those that are involved. I, I'd like to thank the elders, uh, the, the, uh, the amazing staff that we have, and all the volunteers, the super volunteers that makes this church uh, function. Thank you so much. You know, it's an honor for me to pastor this church. It's a real blessing. And I uh, just thank you for the privilege I have to pastor you guys. Thank you so much. All right, I would ask you to stand. We'll place ourselves before the Lord as we go to his word. Father God, we thank you so much for the privilege we have to do this, to be able to come into your courts, to be able to praise, lift your name up, and I thank you that you want to reveal yourself to us, and you have a word in season, and you know each person by name, you know exactly where each person is, you, 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 you want to speak to the, to the young, you want to speak to the elderly, you want to speak to everyone today, and I just pray that you would go beyond my words, and that you would speak by your Holy Spirit, so we just open our hearts up to what you want to say, and what you want to do this morning as we open up to you pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we're a week from Easter, and I just want to invite you. I know that next weekend, it's a long weekend. Can we, can we make it a church weekend where we come together on Good Friday, where we'll break the bread together and, and enjoy uh, the fellowship around uh, communion. So we invite you to come. And also on Sunday, where we're going to talk about the resurrection. Uh, you look at this week, it's really the cornerstone of our faith. So make it a God weekend. Uh, I know that it's a great time to take a break, but it's good for us to come together. All right? I'm going to talk about Palm Sunday, the week before when Jesus arrives to Jerusalem. An amazing story where Jesus arrives on the cult, fulfilling a prophecy of Zechariah. And he arrives to Jerusalem. He's uh, descending the Mount of Olives, and then he's going to be ascending to Jerusalem. And the story goes is that he comes, to, uh, he comes near Jerusalem, and his disciples are rejoicing on the fact that he is coming to Jerusalem. And they're singing and shouting and expressing their, their passion for the, uh, the king that is entering Jerusalem. And the story, as you know, you probably know, or maybe uh, you, you don't, but I'll, if you don't, I'll explain a bit about it. And I'll read it in a moment, but some of you, when you, when you went to Sunday school, that was a, an important lesson of Palm Sunday, and this is where Jesus entered Jerusalem, and the disciples are laying their coats uh, on, the, on the ground and as Jesus is uh, sitting on the colt, and, and, and they're having palm, palm branches, and, and Jesus enters Jerusalem with peace on a colt, meaning that he is coming to give peace. If, uh, if a king would come on a horse, it would talk about war, but he came on the dunk, he's saying that I want to bring peace to humanity, bring peace between us and God, and bring peace between each other. And in this story of Luke 19, there's an emphasis on worship where, where we see the disciples taking the time to worship the Lord. I like to talk about worship today. And I know that worship is, is more than just singing. It's a way of life where you live for his honor and you live for his glory. But when it comes to worship, it's also an expression that we have towards our God. And, and when we look at books that were written on worship, there's quite a few. And there's some books that are written on the benefits of worship, where we see God work or we see God intervene in the life of, of his people when people worship. It says in Psalm 22 that God reigns or inhabits the praise of his people. And so when God inhabits the praise of his people, then anything is possible because God is in the house, right? And one of the desire that we have as Gospel Mission Church, we want to see God in the center of what, everything that we do, right? We want, to, we, we want to give him glory. We want to give him honor and praises. We want to be caught up with him like we sang. And this is a, a big, big deal when it comes to how we live our lives, that we're caught up with the splendor and the beauty of God. And so when we look at Psalm 22, we can see God moving and revealing himself in the context of worship and praise. You also find uh, where the, where the uh, musicians started 
playing and, and they were singing, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever, the glory of God came to the point where they were not able to play anymore because the glory of God was too thick. God responded to the, the worship of his people. I think about King Jehoshaphat when he went to war. He sent his singers ahead of the army and singing praise to God, meaning that they believed that God would make a way and God was saying, I will fight for you. I will make a difference in your life. And then you have also the story of Paul and Silas in prison, right? And they're clapping their chains and they're worshiping the Lord in prison. And what happened is that the door swung open. They were set free, not only for them, but also for all the prisoners that were there. The earth shook. What happened is the jailer wanted to take his life because he kind of missed the goal of taking care of his prisoner because he would probably be killed after. And, and, and Paul came and presented the gospel. And this is where we see him and his family come to the Lord. So there's amazing benefits when it comes to worship, when we see heaven come on earth, and I believe worship is like that, it's a taste of heaven. If you, if you look in the Bible, if you, ha if you have your Bible, there's going to be a place in the back there, Revelation chapter 7, verse 11, it's a snapshot of eternity, it's, 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 a, it's a snapshot of what happens in heaven, and it says, and the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their face before the throne and worshiped God. Can you picture this? They fell on their face and on the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, meaning forever. Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Again, forever. It's pretty cool to see, right? But when it comes to worship, it's way more than our benefit. It's really the calling that we have as a people to give glory and honor and praises to God. Like one of the first commandments is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is expressed through worship, where you live a life of worship, where you live for God's honor, but also when you worship him and you express yourself and when you tell him, you verbalize how awesome he is. And so in the story that we'll read in a moment, we're gonna see the disciples do this. But one of the things we need to understand is uh, what worship is not. Worship is not a style. Worship is not something we conform to or we do like others just because. Uh, worship is not something we copy. And worship is not linked to my personality or my background to say, well, you know, pastor, I'm introverted. Worship for me all happens inside. Um, worship is not linked to your personality. Worship is not linked to your background. I was raised in a background where there was basically nothing. We, we sat quiet there. And I remember in my early years, I didn't understand even a thing because it was done in Latin. So I didn't have a clue what was happening. And, and so, so it's something that, that grows in your life as you see who he is and understand who he is. What worship is, the, the simplest dis, uh, um, definition of worship, it's responding to God. That's what worship is, is responding to God. Can you say to your neighbor that worshiping is to respond to God? Is you respond to God. You're just responding to who God is. And, and, and that's what we're going to see in Luke chapter 19, verse 37, where we see the disciples responding to God. It's not organized. It's not like, okay, sing together at the same time. Ah, uh, you know, it's not like, it's not like a worship song that was rehearsed. It was just responding to God, responding to Jesus, responding to the Messiah that was entering the city. And it's not something that you have to pump yourself or you have to slap yourself in the face. I can do this. I can do this. It's just organic. It's just you just respond. And we do respond to things in life, right? We respond to good news. We respond to bad news. We respond. And so what we see in chapter 19, we see the people responding to the king that is entering Jerusalem. And it's not something that is forced. It's not something that is pressured. It's something that just happens because of, of who is entering the city. So if you have your Bible, take a look at Luke 19. Because this is Palm Sunday. This is where Jesus enters Jerusalem. And it says, as soon as he 
was approaching near the, the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. Verse 38, shouting, blesses, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Verse 41, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which makes, uh, would make your peace but now they, uh, now they have been hidden from your eyes. And the story here is, like I said, Jesus is entering Jerusalem, and the people are responding to who he is. And what were they celebrating? Well, they were celebrating the fact that uh, he is the king and he's the Messiah. And it says that they were rejoicing for the miracles that Jesus had done. And the reason why they were rejoicing for the miracles that Jesus had done is because the proof that he was the Messiah was the miracles. So what Jesus did when he rose Lazarus from the dead, when he fed the multitude, it was a proof that he was the Messiah. And his disciples, this group of disciples, this crowd of disciples, saw it, acknowledged it, and they were pumped. And so what they did is they had palm branches, they laid their coats there, and, and they danced and they rejoiced around the donkey where Jesus was sitting on, and they were rejoicing over the Messiah. And, and you know what happens sometimes? Sometimes. We get confused, we get two story confused. We get, the, the, we get this story confused with uh, the group uh, that are cheering for Barabbas' freedom. Because there's some songs that were written. I remember a song when I grew up, it says, the, the crowd changed. That before they sang, a blessed, he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then later on, the same crowd comes and they cry, crucify, crucify, crucify. I don't believe it was the same crowd. I believe that uh, the zealots, those that wanted to have a, uh, a revolution, political re re revolution in Israel, what they did is they knew that there, was, there would be one of the prisoners that would be released. And they wanted Barabbas to be out. And so, so what they did, I think it was rigged. I really think in commentaries, I'm not the one inventing this, and commentaries and the historians will say that it was, it was probably rigged where the zealots talk, took over the, the, the place and they shouted, crucify Jesus, crucify Jesus. And sometimes we look at Luke 19 and we disregard what happened there because we say, oh, it's the same guys that later on said, crucify, crucify him. I don't think it was the same crowd. But this crowd that we find in Luke chapter 19 is a crowd that understood to a certain level who Jesus was. I don't think they caught the whole picture of the cross and all what it meant, but they saw the miracles, they saw the attributes of, of, of him being the Messiah, and they expressed themselves accordingly. So why do we worship God? Why do we do this every week we worship God? Why do we worship God at home? Why is worship a big deal? It's because Jesus is a king and because he's God. And so when you have a God, you have a king, what you do, you worship. And he's not just a king, he's a king God, right? And, and so, so, so why do we worship God? It's because he's our king. And, and you have a few examples. There's three texts I want to read to you and when it comes to this. It's, it's one of the texts that's found in Acts chapter 17, where Paul is, is in Athens, and he's talking about the unknown God because uh, uh, some, uh, some people wanted to know, some intellectual wanted to know about his doctrine. And so he says in verse 24, he is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands cannot serve his needs, uh, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everyone and satisfies every need. So he's describing God, or he's, he's describing this unknown God as one that rules and majesty, majesty that doesn't need anything. Because the gods of the Greeks, they always were in need. And he says, no, our God is not in need. He's, he's above, he rules in majesty, and he makes the heaven his throne, the earth his footstool. It was a new concept of God because the Greek gods were like us, always fighting. And here we have a God that loves, a God that cares, a God that reigns in majesty, that doesn't need to be fed, that doesn't need anything, that is autosufficient. And you, another text 
I want to read to you is found in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. When David um, wants to have a tent for the Ark of the Covenant where worship would happen. And, and you, you find again this declaration of who God is. It says, O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Can you say that to your neighbor? Recognize the Lord. Recognize the Lord. I don't want to miss on the Lord. I don't want to miss on the Lord. You know, we can miss on the Lord. We can miss the boat. We can miss on the Lord. So he says here, let the earth tremble before him. Um, no, sorry. Uh, o nation of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his presence. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. And then he continues in verse 30. He says, let the earth tremble before him. Let the world stand firm. Uh, the, the world stands firm and cannot be shaken. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Tell all the nations the Lord reigns. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the fields and their crops burst into out with joy. Let the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord for his good. His, um, his faithfulness loves or endures forever. And so when you, you look at this text, it, it, it talks about how God is glorious and, and that he's above everything. Even nature here talks about exalting the Lord. So, so what we find in scripture, and I can't just give you a little snapshot, there's this recognition of Jesus of God uh, being God and worthy of our worship and praise. And so, so we, we, we want to see this. And that's what happened in Luke chapter 19. Uh, they responded to who he was. Like I said, it was organic. It was not push. It was not porous force. It was not manipulated. It, it, it just happened. And if you look at Matthew chapter 21, verse 10, the same story, but from a different gospel, it says when they entered the, the city of Jerusalem, the city was, was stirred saying, who is this? So... The disciples and Jesus are arriving in Jerusalem, and then people are saying, what's happening? Because they're not, they don't know what's happening, right? They're, they're, they're in the city, they're, doing, they're taking care of business, and then you have this group coming in, and they're celebrating, celebrating the Messiah, saying, bless is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna. And there's a different crowd. You have a crowd that is not aware of what's happening, and there's a crowd that is aware. And, and for us, as a church, we are aware Right? We are aware of what's happening. When we read, when we read um, uh, Luke chapter 19, we see, we, see, we, we, we are aware of, of what's happening. And so what we want to see is, is we want to see worship in our lives. Why do we worship God? Is because he's good, right? Because he's good. He's so amazing. And that's why we worship God, like the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's pretty amazing when you, when you just stop and, and think about that, that God so loved the world. And, and you look at where you are now, and I, if I look at my journey, I, I, I don't know where I would be if he would, not, if he would have not come in my life. I look how God rescued us in such an awesome way. God did it. I was telling the elders of my journey of faith. I was giving a little snapshot. I remember preaching at 25, 26 years old. I was invited to preach in northern Quebec. So I'm there preaching my heart out for the weekend. And there was this, uh, these two little ladies in the back of the room that were in their 80s. And uh, they came to see me after and they wanted to shake my hand. One lady had arthritis and when she gave my hand, she could barely like shake my hand. And tears were coming down her face. And, and she said, I can't believe a little lady is preaching the gospel. I just can't believe it. And then I was just, I didn't, I didn't know her. Uh, her last name was Roberge. Uh, I, I, don't, I didn't really know about her. But she told me that many years ago, like 25, 30 years ago, what they did is they prayed for her family. Like they had a little church meeting, a little church building uh, in, a, in, a, in a back road. And in French, it's a Rhin. And they were, uh, I believe, on, uh, on the Rhin 9. And we were on, living on Rhin 7. And, and so they were praying for that region. And they were persecuted. I I have a book uh, that I have in my library of that pastor that was thrown into a river, chained up because of the gospel. That's, uh, that's uh, just about 75 years ago or so. Uh, and um, how, how they were persecuted with the gospel. And then she came to see me and she was saying, Claude, we prayed for you. 
And we interceded for the Lanies. And, 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 and you know, it's amazing in the journey how God uses people, right? And you, you look at how God loves us. He raises people up to intercede, raises people up to walk with us, to love on us. We are the fruit of the blessings or the obedience of other people in our lives, right? And we, we think about God's grace. It, it, it's so amazing. Wherever you are this morning, whatever you're dealing with, God is full of grace. He's full of love for you. Maybe you're not walking walking like you should. Maybe you've drifted away. Maybe you, you feel guilty and you feel unworthy. I just want to let you know that this, the, grace is, the grace of God is so amazing. And this is what brings us to a place of worship because we look at who we are and we look at our issues and God invites us to, to him. And then as we worship him and adore him, it, it just brings you to, to a place of repentance and, and, and surrender because he's so good, Right? And so when we look at the story here of, of Luke chapter 19, we see the disciples responding to Jesus, just simply responding to Jesus. So how many Leaf, um, I was going to see Leaf fans, oh, horrible. Uh, how many Jets fans here, yeah? So I, I, was, I went to see a game a few weeks ago, and they lost, they didn't do very, they didn't do very well, but uh, they scored the first goal, and the whole crowd went up, rah, and I, caught, I was caught a little off guard. I'm like, okay. When I, when, but I was ready for the second one. So they score a second one. I'll be like bouncing up and say, yeah, go Jets, go. Um, but imagine you're going to a Jets game, and then they're winning 10-0. That would be pretty cool, eh? Like the first service, if someone said, no, it's impossible. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> so, so they're winning 10-0. And then it's like in the third period, you start to think, hey, man, like, maybe I should leave early and get away from this, get out of the city. They don't have to deal with the parking and all that. Let's do that early. And then you're, you're not engaged anymore, right? So they scored 11 goal. Are you going to bounce off your chair? Probably not, right? Ah, another one. I, I think it happens to us, too, when it comes to our faith, is that we heard about the love of God, the crucifixion, the resurrection, amazing plan that God has for us. When we were kids, we hear it over and over again. And now we come to a point we hear it again. Ah, ah, it doesn't change us. It doesn't move us. Well, I know it's a big difference between a puck and a net and eternity, eternity and how God loves us. But sometimes we forget how God is amazing and how faithful he is. And we just sit there, and we just don't really understand what's happening. It's like, when you look at who he is, and we look at what he has done for us, there should be a response. Like, there should be a response. Let's say one day you'll see him, we'll see him face to face. Are you gonna see him face to face with your hands in your pocket? Hey dude. I don't think you'll approach God with your hands in your pocket. You won't say, oh, yeah, cool. No. It's going to be like the first, beyond the first goal of a Stanley Cup, and your team is winning. You'll be jumping off your seat, boy. You'll be shouting. You'll be on your knees weeping. You're going to be totally captivated by him. It's the same thing what we're doing as a church. You know, we're, God is in the house. God is in your car. God is in your house. In your house, and and we can't we can't just go through the motion and not respond. Like what I'm saying here, I'm not saying fit into this box or or do this and and do that or no. And I think it's not linked to your personality. It's not linked to your background. It's responding to God. Just responding to God. It's not even organized in Luke chapter 19. They're just re responding for, to the Messiah that's arriving to Jerusalem. And for us, we know the end of the story. We know what happened. We see the proof of God in our lives. We look at, at our journey and we see God's intervention all the time. It should bring me to a place where I respond. It should be organic. It should not be forced. It should not be, like, we could give a, we could talk on worship, how it looks and all that, lifting of the hands, celebrating, uh, being ver verbal and all that. Fine and dandy, but it should not even need to be taught. 
Like, you don't teach a kid to respond to music. They just do it. But what happened is that we've been caught by all kind of junk, all kind of uh, um, pressure, image, what people think, and, uh, and it boxes up, it boxes us up. And so it's important to say, what is stopping me of being free? Of responding to, 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 to Jesus. Like, I, I look at the disciples. They responded because they acknowledged who he was. They acknowledged that he was the king and that he was going to Jerusalem as the Messiah. And so I, I want to respond to him. You know, sometimes I hear, well, you know, it's, 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 it's not something you should impose. Absolutely not. It's just a question of responding. Like when you are at the, uh, not the MTS anymore, but uh, Canada Life Center, like people are just responding for, to this little puck that enters a goal. So I got to respond to God. It just makes sense, right? It just makes sense. You look at verse 37. It says, the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully. Give a smile to your neighbor. <laughs> joyfully with loud voice. Loud voice, loud voice. Like it just happened. Like, just happened. It, 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 just, it just did it, right? And then you look at verse 38. Shouting. Wow. Bless is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the high as they're declaring who he is. God, you reign. You're the king. You're amazing. Like, wow. What's preventing me of doing this? What's preventing us of, of doing this, of living this way, and also expressing that to the next generation, showing the way? You, you look at verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. First, let them to be quiet. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's too much here. First of all, they didn't. They didn't recognize Jesus. That's why they responded this way. They were like the people in the city that did not know what was happening when Jesus was coming in. They were not aware. But when you're aware of who Jesus is and you're aware of what he has done, something bubbles up. And so the Pharisees are not happy because they're out of line. And secondly, they didn't like what was being said that Jesus was the Messiah, the King. And I believe there's a battle over your life because the enemy doesn't want you to verbalize Jesus as your king. Like we sang song today that are focused on Jesus, giving praise, giving glory to, to Jesus. And here the Pharisees would say, hey, be quiet. So it's a spiritual matter. It's not an online matter. It's not an order matter. It's a spiritual matter. And we see them Worshiping the Lord, and, and then the Pharisees are saying this, be quiet, tell them to stop. And look what it says in verse 40. And Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. I always picture how it would be to have stones cry out, right? <laughs> but what was Jesus saying? There needs to, there, there's a need for a response, there's a need for a response because look, look what's happening. The world is being reconciled to Father. I'm going to lay my life down so that the sins of the world will be on me. He becomes this eternal sponge that uh, sucks her sins and takes her the past, the present, and the future. It's amazing, right? And so Jesus is aware of what's, what he's doing. He says, hey, guys, like, no, if they don't, then the stones will. And, and we know it too. And, and so for us, when it comes to this amazing story, it's important for us to, to take a hold of worship and praise and seeing us a way we respond. You look at John chapter 12, verse 3, the story of Mary with extravagant worship. And that's just before Jesus arrives to Jerusalem. And because she understands that he's going to, to die, that he's going to die. And it says, And Mary took a pound of very costly oil of uh, spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with fragrance of oil. And, 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 and it's, it's like, the cost of that is like a, a middle average man that works six days a week and uses all the amount of one year's salary on Jesus' feet. Unreal when you think about that. Extravagant worship. She's just caught up with Jesus. And there's this expression of loving on Jesus, you know, 
I think it's so, so amazing and so challenging at the same time. The question I have for you, how should we respond to Jesus? I ask you the question, how, how are you going to respond to Jesus? And I, I believe that God wants you to respond with your heart from within. God wants you to respond with your life, to live a life of honor. God wants you to respond with your resources where you surrender everything to him. But also that you respond with your mouth and your expression. Like Hebrew chapter 13, verse 15 says, Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifices of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks for his name. So my prayer is that as a people, we would, we would respond to him. And it, it, it's not another box. It's not a structure. It's just a church that comes together in response to the faithfulness of God and also his royalty and his amazing grace for us. Amen, I would ask you to stand. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not sync with God. You're not sync with God. And just invite you to surrender your life to him and know there's grace for you this morning. That you're not here by accident. That God has a word for you saying, my son, my daughter, I love you. I want to be in your life. But there's a freedom that God has given us because God hasn't called us to be robots, but to be a people that choose to love him or to serve him based on our willingness and so you have the choice this morning to open your heart up and say, God, I, I give you my life. I give you my struggles. I give you my lack of focus where I'm giving myself to everything else but you. Be the center of my life. And maybe you're here this morning and you've never committed your life to Jesus. Maybe you came with a family member, with a friend, and you don't know Jesus on a personal level. You heard about him. You Maybe you heard about him in, in kids' ministry, but you've never committed your life to Jesus. You've never said, Lord, here's my life. I repent of my sin. I want you in my life. I invite you to do that this morning because this is what's central. It's the message of grace where God says, come to me, receive life. So I pray that you would receive life. Maybe you're here this morning and and you're caught in your emotions, caught in your heart. You're not able to express for whatever reason. I invite you to see the beauty of God, see his greatness and his, his love for you and that he is God where he makes the earth his footstool and just be caught up with him and just respond to him. In Jesus' name, amen.